You know, you even look at Seneca and he was somebody who would often go to the views of Epicurus, right? And say, and, and, and he would say all the time, like, you know, just because this is kind of our rival philosophy doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at it. Like, I should be constantly watching them almost like a spy, right? Seeing what the other side's doing, because they might have something valuable to say. And then you also look at what they did in terms of negative visualization, which is a brilliant technique if you're thinking about debating, right? It's like, what are all the possible ways that somebody could could tell you that you're wrong? And if you find some good, value, you know, valid arguments in that arsenal of arguments, then you either need to change your opinion or figure out how you might be right, you know. But, um, you know, like it's a brilliant technique, right? Have, have you used that in terms of your... Or I guess you kind of do, right? Negative visualization, how could I be wrong and figure it out? Oh, absolutely. And so... Um... So there are there are two parts to this. Um, one of them is um, the reason why Seneca had to have all the proleptic things about, like saying, "Hey, you know, I know that I'm a Stoic, but hey, you know, the the the, the Epicureans have got stuff to say too. The truth belongs to every to all those who are interested mm. in wisdom." Um, uh, the first thing is that uh, is that. One of the reasons why he had to say that was because of the fact that the the schools mm -hmm. were uh, highly insular, and mm -hmm. and and so that was when one cast one's lot uh, intellectually. Uh, the school going to school in philosophy wasn't like going to a philosophy department now, where you've got you know we've got an X and a Y and a Z and a person who thinks that X Y and Z are nonsense and yeah. Um, uh, that you might say pluralism in philosophy schools wasn't the case then they were schools and they were dogmatic and mm. in both the sense that they liked which was that they had truths that they reminded themselves of and lived in light of but also in our sense in which they uh, for the most part held each other in contempt mm. uh, and that shows up uh especially with someone like cicero earlier um really showing a lot of contempt or some uh, rival schools when speaking in the, the the voices of some of the some of the representatives. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so that's that's one of the first things, which was uh, uh, for as mu for as open minded as we would like to conceive of our intellectual ancestors, um, for the most part, they were a lot of all in dogmatic dogmatic programs. And yeah. the, there's a reason why the skeptical criticisms had the bite they did uh, on these programs. Uh, mm. uh, and, and it had to do with the fact that uh, the you might say the intellectual incuriousness that happened in a lot of the schools. Seneca mm. is in this regard a kind, Seneca, and in some ways Cicero's later um, uh, uh, um, eclecticism is a little bit of an outlier in that regard. So I, I agree with you that Seneca is a good model, but uh, but it's because of a sort of a really significant background of these schools being being highly regimented and. Not mm. really. Uh, in fact, even in fact, even kind of looking at those who um, who left them as in some ways real disappointments. Um, mm. We even have the story. So just as a, a background about that is that yeah. we even have that story of uh, Diogenes of Heraclea, uh, who was one of Zeno's, the Zeno of Sidium's, the first students. Um, and uh, after a while, he's does, he's not coming to Zeno's lectures anymore. Mm. Zeno, the, the Stoic. He's not coming to see his lectures anymore. It's like, what the hell? Where the heck is this guy? He shows back up, and it turns out that he had um, he had had to pass a uh, a kidney stone. And he said, and he returns, and he informs everyone, "I've learned something very important, and I'm no longer a stoic because I know now that pain is a bad." <laughs> that's brilliant i love those little tidbits those little that's moments great, that we it's <laughs> a really great little story um but uh, but it is a it is a it, it is one of these kind of cases where and again it has to come and by the way that story did not come from any stoics it came from critics of the stoic yeah. uh, of stoic uh, it's told by uh on the one hand diogenes laertius and uh cicero gives a puts that puts that in the mouth of an epicurean Mm. Uh, giving, yeah. give, and needling a stoic in the in the Tusculan disputations. So it's a good it's a good story, and it's clearly one that sort of the Stoics had to sort of, and it and it scored two points, right? It was a it was on the one hand, hey, you know, you say that pain's not really a bad. What about like really significant pain? And moreover, yeah. someone who was a convinced Stoic got convinced by the pain yeah. uh, that it was a bad. So it was a sort of a double a double move. Um, <laughs> So the second part of that uh, of the answer is is that 
being be, being someone who's open to being wrong and these and and I like how, I like the term that you used uh, these negative visualizations uh, that is um, in some ways part of the training that I try to give my students. So mm. every paper that they write, I say your paper should have a handful of sections. You need to explain a problem to me. You need to explain the literature on how folks have been working on this problem. So give me, you know, tell me what the problem is. Tell me what the philosophical mm. problem is. Tell me a little bit about the discussion on the problem and where things are, you know, up to now on the problem. It doesn't have to be the sort of the 2,500 years on the problem. Just, you know, give me like, give me a quick account as to where folks have been working on the problem. Mm. Tell me what your move is. But then you need to be able to think of – because if, you've, if you're capable of telling the story as to the debate, you should be able to then take up the perspective of one of the positions on the debate and be able to say. Because if you can't, you don't understand the position on the debate. If you have no yeah. idea what someone who you disagree with would say back to you, right, then you yeah. really haven't understood the debate. You really haven't mm. understood them. Again, that's a, kind of a million thought again, which is mm. if you can't think of an objection to your view. Yeah. That, that's a problem because you just don't really understand then where the stakes are. So it's kind of like you have to play out the whole debate in your mind before you even have it, right? It's that's like right. you stand on this side, you give your argument, and then you go over here and you say exactly what they would say to you about that. And honestly, when you really think about it right, most of us have a pretty good idea at the back of our minds of what somebody could say to our argument. We just choose not to pull it out, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and so, you know, you think, of, you think of all the debates that you've won in the shower, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> think of all those times to put it. Yeah. Right, that you really gave them what for, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, th I think the, the, the skill – so that's, that's no great, that's no great uh, achievement, again, mm -hmm. uh, that we've even got a, ter a term for it. Um, instead, instead, practice the following. Uh, imagine winning the debate with you. In the mm. shower, yeah. That's an exercise in humility, right? Mm. Um, it is. It's a. It's a strange place to be, um, because then you come out. And you're like, now I don't know what I believe. <laughs> I just refuted. I just repudiated myself. Right? Yeah. Good thing yeah. I'm clean. I guess at least. At least <laughs> I'm clean. Yeah. 